Hello everyone, I'm Florence Theriault and I'm here to talk to you today about some of the wonderful treasures that we have are showing in our latest book, As If in a Looking Glass. These are rare treasures from the 18th and 19th century uh, and we will have three parts to this, uh, uh, this video. The first part I will talk about some wonderful automatons with mo movement, music, and amusing actions that are going to be included. The second part will feature dolls from the 19th century with wonderful trousseaus made at the time and their family histories. And the third part will feature fine early continental dolls from the Margaret Woodbury Strong collection. So let's get started. A very, very popular manifestation in automaton was the costumed monkey, usually costumed as a marquee or a painter or a scholar, a teacher. Um, and this collectors look at these today and they say, oh, I don't know, monkeys as people? Well, this is a really important historical trend that took place starting back really in the 16th century and finding full force about mid-1700s. Uh, there's a very, very famous painting which hangs in the Louvre in Paris called, the, in English translated, The Monkey Artist, in which a costumed uh, monkey, costumed as a French painter, is sitting and he's painting a figure of a man on his screen. Um, there, this hangs in the Louvre. There is a room at the Chateau de Chantilly outside of Paris that is called well, again, translated into English, the monkey room. And the entire walls of this room and the entire decor, walls, ceiling, floor, everything, are vignettes of monkeys costumed as people in playful scenes. So the theme was very, very fanciful. Now, what was this all about? Well, partly people were just kind of found it amusing and fanciful to dress um, monkeys as people in the same way that sometimes today you see people will dress their dogs as people. But this went on for quite some time and was very fanciful and it was also, particularly in France, a kind of a gentle way of mocking the nobility and the aristocracy. If they could be dressed in these clothes from the peak of the aristocratic time, the end of the 1700s, then they kind of were mocking them, but in a kindly and gentle way. Now, this trend of costuming uh, monkeys as people and putting them in amusing scenes moved into the automaton field as well. And an entire series of automaton were made by very various doll makers, various uh, automaton makers with this idea in mind. One of the most uh, prolific makers of the monkey automatons, almost like a series, was Jean Fallebois. And I have two of them to show you today. Um, one of them is the professor who is instructing his young student who has to stand up on a little bench in order to reach the blackboard. And he's holding, the professor has two books in his hand and he is holding his teaching stick. And one of the books is a history of France and the other we can't really tell because he's holding it open. The student is sitting and he is doing his arithmetic on the blackboard and actually I, I really must be crazy because today I actually sat down and did his addition and wanted to make sure there wasn't a little joke there and maybe he was adding it wrong. But what is a little joke is he's also drawn down at the bottom of the blackboard, if you, if you notice that, he's drawn a picture of his professor of a monkey head. So he's kind of, not only is the entire automaton mocking nobility, but he is mocking him in particular. There's so many actions that take place here. Um, the professor is blinking his eyes, opening and closing them, turning his head from side to side and nodding and waving his teaching um, instruction, and then opening and closing his jaw as though he is speaking to the student. The student, on the other hand, draws his, as though he's drawing on the blackboard and his eyes also blink and he opens and closes his mouth as though he's, well, either answering the teacher or sassing him back and you can leave it to your imagination. I think this is the wonderful thing about automatons and I find when I catalog, when I catalog them I'm always finding myself describing the scene that's going on which I guess is my own imagination. I'm imagining what scene is happening and this is one of the great joys of automatons. They are very interactive in that way in that they, they bring your own imagination or your own history or your own sense of what a scene would be to the play. Now the entire time this is, this is going on and these movements are all synchronized. 
and again, collectors don't always pay attention to this, the importance of how the movements were synchronized, they don't all happen simultaneously. They happen one after another, or two movements that would or that should belong together will be happening at the same time. And that's part of telling the entire story. And we're going to show this happening in the meantime. On this side, we have the monkey who is costumed as, of course, as a French painter, because what could be more significant in French history than their, than their artistry and their wonderful paintings. And here he's out in the wooded glen with the paper mache foundation. He's standing looking at a scene of nature with a bower over his head. A little extra luxury touch because the vignettes were made for the parlor, for the living room, is there is a clock in the rock, uh, in the formation of the rock. Now the monkey is standing here, <clears throat> he's holding a palette in his hand and he's holding his paintbrush in the other, and there actually is a wonderful painting on his easel of a bird in a midst of flowers, and the actual oil colors on his palette are the colors that he is painting. So very, very realistic, wonderful touches to make everything accurate. And then when the movement and, and music start, he has a series of actions as well, involving blinking his eyes, moving his jaw, and so he might be speaking to some passerby who's made some comment, good morning, sir, and he's saying good morning to them and he goes on with his painting. Um, again, my imagination at play. Um, and holding the palette and then dabbing at his easel to complete his painting. In our one world culture of today, it's very difficult for us to understand how fascinated people of the 18th and 19th century were with what they called the exotic cultures, mostly of the East. Um, the world was opening up, uh, steamship travel was being made possible, even rail travel to some extent, and more and more people were coming to Paris and they were greeted with awe and respect by the Parisians who tried to copy aspects of their culture into products that they were producing, both for people in France and for the people, the their so-called exotic people who would take them back home. They were, one of the things they were very fascinated with was the uh, Turkish uh, custom of the smoking tobacco and drinking that very strong uh, Turkish coffee. Actually, this tradition had originated uh, in India and then it, by the 16th century had made its way to the Ottoman Empire. We look at it entirely differently today, but we have to look at it through the eyes of the 19th century. If you were invited to come in and smoke a pipe of tobacco with the Sultan, that was the highest honor that could be bestowed on you. And it was a very um, precise, um, regulated kind of ceremony that you would do. The Nargyle, I hope I'm saying that right, the Nargyle uh, jar was here containing the tobacco. And in this case, um, Leopold Lambert, who made the automaton, did such wonderful details as having the uh, braided cord going to the bone-handled pipe, beautifully sculpted fingers on, on the hands. And the other side, you would have the coffee cup of that very, very um, strong, strong black Turkish coffee. And the tradition was you would take um, a puff of the tobacco, and then you would take a drink of the strong, uh, strong Turkish coffee. When Leopold Lambert uh, created this particular example, he did such wonderful details as having this turban of silk, this like four layer braided turban of silk that's wound around his head. And I, I'm always talking about how costumes of the 19th century, boy, these could be stylish and fashionable today. And I wanna tell you that turban could be pretty fashionable today. With a diamond crest in the front, a velvet jacket with wonderful metallic thread, and then the um, silk uh, like harem style pants, and finally the slippers that are made the same as the jacket with a metallic thread. And this whole um, scene is created in such a wonderful, realistic, relaxed manner that he has one slipper on his foot and the other is tacked to the base uh, that he's sitting on as though he slipped it off in his mood of relaxation. This wonderful piece is just beautifully preserved with the exception of some frailty to his silk harem pants and some wear to the velvet carpet upon which he is seated. And he has the wonderful move, wonderful eye movements, jaw movements, inhaling, drawing the pipe to his mouth, drawing it away, and then alternately lifting the coffee cup as though to sip. The whole time he is seated in this wonderful realistic manner and two tunes play and in this case, it's so beautifully preserved that two original paper tunes are still 
Um, the two original tunes are still listed on their original paper label at the back of the underbase. Uh, the piece is in, it's a wonderful original packing box which we've turned upright so you can read the letterings and it has, this is Haute, this side up, and Très Fragile, and Bas, this is the side down, so people would actually have it, you know, store it correctly. A wonderfully and beautifully preserved piece with wonderful actions, a great um, symbol of 19th century society, and wonderfully preserved.